Thank you all for tuning in. This is a panel I'm very excited about because it's uh, it was a particular request to include something specific on the rise of growth capital in Europe that we feel um, very passionate about at Hermes GPE. And one of the, the parts that I'm very excited about for this panel, uh, there's, a, there's a saying in Greek uh, that you, you judge someone by the quality of the company they keep. I think there's the same one in English. Uh, and I could not be happier with a panel that we have constituted um, today, uh, which uh, we'll pass on to the, uh, the panelists to introduce themselves in a second. But this is a very important development in private equity as a whole. Those of you that know us, uh, we know, you know that we have a very uh, wide remit of activity at, at Hermes GPE. And we've decided to focus quite a bit on growth capital. And I've decided to devote my investment focus on that over the last decade. So this is a very high conviction area um, for us. Now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass on to the um, panelists to introduce themselves. Carolina, maybe starting with you. Of course. Thank you so much, Elias, for, for you know, agreeing to, to moderate us here and also for the conference for, for having me. I'm super thrilled to be here. Um, I'm Carolina. I'm a partner at EQT um, and a founding team member at the new growth strategy that we're launching at EQT to invest in tech, tech-enabled businesses at that critical point at which they have product market fit, they have a playbook, and they want to scale that into some direction. Our sweet spot is um, investing anywhere between 50 and 200 million in equity um, and predominantly doing so in Europe. Um, I'm really bullish in the sector, excited to talk about it. Prior to EQT, I was at SoftBank Vision Fund, investing in, in growth businesses globally. And prior to that, I was at Atomico, um, and starting in, in, in 2012, investing early on. And so I've been super lucky to see the evolution of the ecosystem. Great. Thank you, Carolina. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Elias. Very excited to be here. Um, so quick background myself, um, David Klein, one of the two founding partners and managing partners of One Peak uh, here in Europe. We're currently investing out of a 443 million euro fund, a tech the 10 to 60 million euro size bracket, uh, particularly in B2B, um, and that's mostly software, fintech, communications technology, and infrastructure technology. We see a tremendous amount of great European entrepreneurs. Europe has always had uh, very good R&D talent, and we're now also seeing that come through um, in the companies that we're seeing in our size bracket. So um, I'm really excited about Europe today and especially excited about the next few years. Great. Thank you, David. And Jean? Over yeah, hi. Thank you, Elias, for creating this panel. Uh, I'm, I'm Jean Schmidt, managing partner and founder of Jolt Capital. So we're investing in growth equity in tech in Europe. Uh, and our tickets would be slightly smaller than EQT. We are kind of a 15 to 50 million uh, investment per company. Uh, and uh, myself, I've been uh, for a while being on the other side of the fence, running my own company. So as a CEO and growing them after being for 10 years at Sofinova as a venture capitalist. And then when I was done dreaming, uh, I decided to go on how to grow companies and uh, create a jolt. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And uh, as you can see, a fairly diverse panel that, uh, you know, with a, a German, a French, a Brazilian and a Greek, it almost sounds like the beginning of a, of a lame joke. But um, before we go into the, uh, the, the, the main panel, I would like to bring everyone's attention to a poll that's running on the Super Investor platform that should be visible. And we'd like to get the audience's instinctive reaction to a very simple question. Um, based on data for 2019, there were four to five million developers in the United States for the same year. Roughly how many developers would there be in Europe? You can choose options from two, three, four, five, six million. And we'd love to get your instinctive feedback. Please don't look it up, otherwise I kind of defeats the purpose, um, and we'll get to that uh, in a second. But while we're waiting for the voting um, to take place, and as we are all quite used to now, 
doing everything from uh, from uh, Zoom and, and different locations. And it all feels like a very, very globalized world where it all kinds of start to feel very homogeneous. Uh, I was wondering if we can start with, is there anything special about Europe? Any Anything... Um, uh, funny, maybe from the portfolio uh, companies that you are that you are working with, that makes it uh, feel a bit more special operating in Europe these days. Uh, if I if I can, you know, it's incredible to operate in Europe because you see completely different cultures, way to operate, and situations. The, the last one I saw, which were in- incredible for us, was. A fantastic company, very profitable, raising money and suddenly deciding to stop any further due diligence because they managed to get a COVID emergency loan while they were doing very well of such an amount of money that, you know, raising money was not useful anymore. They can grow with the emergency COVID loan. So beautiful. That was in France, of course. (laughs) <laughs> this building, building the French champions. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to compete with it. You have to compete with the state now for uh, for providing capital to you. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think another another story, and that's what we see very often here at One Peak is when we start diligence, we're um, working on the business plan together with the company, and uh, we ask them. Why don't we spend more in sales and marketing? The answer we very often get, especially from bootstrap companies, our product is just so good, it sells itself. Why do we need salespeople? Uh, And that's typically a a great thing to hear for us as an investor. But then the answer always is, so why don't we hire some salespeople? Then we sell even more of it. Excellent. That's a great great entry point, actually, to what uh, can be done differently uh, to the future that we'll get to uh, towards the end of the of the of the panel. Um, I've got the results fresh, hot off the press here. So the answer across the two to six million uh, of developers. Again, the benchmark that we set for the question was about four million developers, four to five million developers in the U.S. How many developers are there in Europe? And it's interesting that two thirds of the respondents have voted for 2 million or 4 million, so less than or equal to the United States. And about a third, 34% on um, uh, the, uh, actually, sorry, uh, only 17% on, uh, on, on 6 million and, and no one on 5 million. So effectively only one in six of our participants got it right because the answer counterintuitively because usually you want to avoid the uh, extreme options in a, in any kind of uh, question set. Uh, the, the correct answer was 6 million, i.e. well above the developer population in the United States. And there's a clear reason why we ask this question, because when we're talking about European growth equity, one of the instinctive reactions that people have uh, certainly, I can talk about it as an LP or my, with my LP hat on. Uh, is that you know Europe is 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 so much smaller uh, a market than than the US and so on. And in a number of very real variables, like for example, how many developers you have to build those great tech companies, um, the answer is actually completely the opposite. So here we have. Uh, in Europe, more than 50% more developers than the US. Again, based this was based out of uh, data from, from Stack Overflow. I'm not gonna guarantee it myself, but I think this is what the, um, what the, uh, the purpose of this uh, initial uh, pop quiz was. Now, without um, trying to test our audience anymore, uh, let's go on to test our panelists. Um, and, and kicking it off with this with this context of where does Europe fit in the global growth scene? How is the European growth scene developing on a global scale? Maybe it's best we start with EQT and Carolina coming from a, a global manager. Um, Carolina, any any initial uh, thoughts on this? Yes, and super excited that this was the question that was asked to the audience. I think what we at EQTC is a very clear 
market opportunity um, when it comes to growth. We see more talent flowing into growth um, and technology companies. Um, you know, people that might have joined banks or consulting firms are now joining tech firms. And then those tech firms in Europe are growing, are having exits, and those people are seeing um, how a tech company works and operates. Um, which means more companies are being founded every year and emerging. And I think that in conjunction with that, we see more funding across the stages of matur maturity from seed to all the way to pre-IPO and IPO. Um, and then we see outcomes getting bigger. And so just to, to level set that with some stats, when we use a very simple metric, right, which may be the number of billion dollar companies, for example, there were 30 in Europe in 2014. There's over 115 today. In terms of aggregate value, it was 90 billion in 2014, and it's 420 billion today. And actually, on this developer point, on the talent side, I think the most interesting thing is that in 2014, the US had about you know, 4 million developers. Today, in 2019, I guess, there's still 4 million developers, whereas in Europe, that number was 4 million in 2014, and it's 6 million today. So you can see that that's growing. Um, and so I think that's what's really exciting. It's there's, you know, there's more companies, there's more capital, and there's an increasing amount of talent. That's very, very um, good to, to set us off uh, in such a positive note, um, Carolina. Um, Jean, anything um, else you'd like to add to this particular question? Um, when you formed your company, clearly you had an option as to where to focus the, the investment strategy. How do you see the European growth scene developing uh, in, this, in this global context? Yeah, in, you know, in, in, uh, when we started, uh, we had a lot of objections, like if there, is, there are not enough company in Europe, you know, how many targets per year are you going to be able to find? And in, in order to answer that, we created a crowding tool, which is going on the web and finding tons of deals automatically. And just a few numbers as well. In, uh, at the end of, uh, of 19, uh, we had in this database found 194,000 companies in Europe, which are defined by gross technology in Europe. So this is a very deep market, which we are just scratching right now. And if you look now uh, where we are with the same software, stupid software, crowding the internet and finding targets, we are now at 270,000 and adding another 10,000 per year. So on a, on a global scale, we have around a million company now in other database, scaling very, very fast in Asia. Uh, but on the European side, we are still finding companies on a monthly basis, like 10,000 a month. So I wonder when this system is going to tell us, guys, you know, I'm done, I found everything. But so far, we keep invading those companies, which are, you know, here I'm giving numbers of companies which are above above 40 people. So some are smallish, uh, but uh, very quickly you will find companies at 150 employees. So, uh, and in terms of, of uh, geographical uh, spread, you know, it's, it's quite spread across Europe. So there is no one sweet spot where you can go. UK is quite big, uh, but France, Germany, uh, Nordics are, are, quite, are quite big as well. So you would say 15% Nordics, 25% Germany, 25% France, a little bit more like 28% in the UK. So here you have a kind of a good picture of the UK. Southern Europe uh, is far less active. Interesting. And that's actually leads very well into the next question. So, so you, if you're looking now within the European growth equity space, uh, you mentioned your geography uh, orientation, which um, set, or how do you think about it in terms of segments of investment opportunity where Europe might be leading the world then um, from, from your perspective? Yes, there are places where Europe is going, would fail if they try too hard. It's copying the US doesn't make any sense. Uh, so trying to become the, uh, the, software, uh, the software company of the world, th th this is over, that's done already. So, but there are domains where we are incredibly good and it's everything that is related to a strong IP and patenting activity. So ju just numbers again, counterintuitive numbers. Uh, today in, uh, in Europe, if you look, compare 2007, 2017, we had in Europe around a million, uh, 1.2 million patents in force. 
in, uh, in, in 2007. Now we have around 3 million patents in force. So we have an incredible activity at creating proper intellectual property. If you look at our competitors, USA, we were at the same stage in 2007, 1.5 million uh, patents in force. But now there are only a 2.2 million patents in force in the US and China is much below. So in terms, not only in terms of number of patents, we are above the rest of the world, but on the top of it, in terms of patenting activity, so creating new things, we are growing much faster than the rest of the world. The sad thing is that in terms of, if you look at the balance sheet of our companies, it's uh, in average half of the balance sheet of what you would find in the US or what you would find in Asia. So we don't finance enough our companies right now, but the fundamentals, the number of developers, the number of engineers, the, the patenting activity, here we are excellent. And if you ask me, what are those domains where there is most IP? Um, so if you look at the European Patent Office, you would find many numbers, but for example, we are by far number one in the world regarding what's called measurement, whatever is around metrology, sensors, industry 4.0, we are much, much higher, uh, twice as big as the US, for example, which is uh, number two. Uh, if you look at uh, telecommunications, for example, we are quite at par with the US and China. Uh, when you look at other domains like optics, robotics, AI, uh, we are actually excellent. So, I mean, we are number one or number two. Semiconductor, we are a little bit below because that is, this is a domain where Europe did not invest much. But robotics, optics, AI, you know, we are the kings of the world if we invest enough in ourselves. Fantastic. So robotics, optics, AI, measurement, the number of, of, of segments, uh, you're tracking where, where Europe uh, you think is leading the world. Um, David, anything to add in terms of this question? So which areas or segments uh, one peak might be oriented towards where you see a leadership for Europe versus um, or at least standing out in a, in a global scale? Yeah, and I think everything that Jean said before makes a lot of sense. I think that the two sectors I would add to that is um, one fintech. Um, I, as you can see, there are lots of large companies coming out of Europe, like the Revoluts of the world. Um, uh, clearly, regulators help, have helped on this front with um, open banking, with PSD2, London as a, a global financial services hub, a great amount of talent here. So um, fintech uh, is clearly something where Europe is ahead of um, the US. And then I think um, it's hard to generalize, but within SME software, you have certain segments where Europe is um, at par or ahead of the, the US. And that's probably something that has emerged relatively late, given that an on-premise product is of course not the right product for SMEs. Um, and with the emergence of SaaS, um, it's only become profitable for companies to sell to SMEs as well. Uh, for example, with regards to HR tools, with regards to accounting tools, workflow automation, and so on. So um, we're seeing a number of really interesting companies uh, in Europe uh, in that regard. Um, just to mention a couple, Pandadoc out of our portfolio, a workflow automation software company, DataGuard, a compliance software business for GDPR, and so on. Um, and I think the, the last point to mention is that Europe overall, and that um, Carolina mentioned that before in terms of the number of the developers, is extremely diversified in terms of talent. So we have a great amount of technical universities in every country across, across Europe, really. Um, and that is a real advantage for European companies, A, when it comes to cost, because the cost of development talent is just a lot lower compared to the US. Uh, and B, also in terms of retaining that talent, um, because if you start a business in San Francisco, um, you can be sure that Apple or Google or any of the other large businesses will come after your best developers and will pay them uh, increasingly high salaries. And it's going to be very difficult to retain them. And to give you some stats around um, the talent here, um, Europe is home to three of the top five, as well as 31 of the top 100 computer science programs in the world. And that includes Oxford, Cambridge, ETH in Zurich, and so on. Um, and also, if you look at the large US players like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, 
all of them have research centers or engineering centers in Europe. And if you combine that amount of people that you see on LinkedIn um, with people in Europe, that gets you to 13,000. So there are 13,000 European employees working for the, the top five US players in Europe. So we're really excited about the talent. And it's really all about enabling that talent, giving them the right capital, having the right environment uh, to become global companies. So that's a lot of um, confluence here across the panel in terms of um, talent and uh, IP and the ability to drive uh, innovative technologies up to through to the scale up um, piece. Now, if we shift a little bit to the investment mindset, so for people on the audience that um, are looking to make allocation decisions and investment strategy decisions as to how do they tap this apparently interesting um, segment. Um, it would be interesting to engage on how is the GP ecosystem, the ecosystem of specialist players uh, or generalist uh, players uh, but, uh, addressing uh, this, this particular opportunity. Um, so I think we can all have a go on that. I'd like to start a little bit with my own uh, LP hat on this, uh, if I may, which is that we are looking at, I think, multitude of different edge potential that, that, that different players might have. Uh, and it's clear to us that for the more uh, esoteric parts of the growth equity space where you need a lot more subject matter expertise, you need more specialization. And one of the things that we are observing in the market, and I would really be interested in your views across the panel, is um, this sort of relative orientation between specialists and generalists and between established and emerging managers. And we, we sort of have a, a mix of of all of them across uh, across even this this small group, um, so for us we partner with both. Uh, we like we love to partner with specialists when it comes to a more specialist domain, um, like for example B two B software and healthcare um, type of place. But we're also equally partnering with some of the more established uh, names that 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 can cover the whole uh, continent and multi sectors um, where, where we, when we think that that's right. Um, Carolina, maybe um, I can engage with you on this and maybe, you know, if anybody else wants to take a view on, on, the, on this point, um, happy to jump in af after Carolina. Yeah, of course. And I think, you know, jumping off the, 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 the previous question into this one, I think what you see is because there are so many great opportunities, great founders, great companies, there's more capital flowing into the space and also an emerging number of managers, right? Um, which you have a few on this panel, including, you know, ourselves launching this new sort of growth, growth initiative. Um, the way I view it, and I think this ties back to the geos, is in Europe, you have a lot of local networks. So particularly at the early stage, you have local funds who are really plugged into the founders, the angel community, etc. You have the specialists, and I think this is across the across the spectrum from early to late. And then you have what it maybe are the sort of larger global funds like EQT um, that can actually carry a founder through the life cycle of the company from seed all the way to IPO and actually post IPO. Um, and as I, th as, as I see the, the growth market and as I, I see post COVID, there's a real flight to quality and you do have to differentiate, differentiate yourself as a manager. And that can be in, in some of these ways. So I think the days of the generalist manager that, that was just capital, I think, you know, those, those funds are going to struggle a little bit more as opposed to the funds that have a clear theme, I'll call it, as opposed to, you know, a theme, a focus. You can think about the market, the segment, um, and, and then be really value added, hopefully, to your founders afterwards in, in the journey. So um, strong support on the on the more specialization, and in noting the time, uh, I'd like to just have one final question, if I can, over to you, David. Perhaps looking into the future, 
Um, how do we expect the European growth equity market to develop, let's say, over the next five or 10 years? Uh, what, in particular, what can European policymakers, to the degree we have any on the audience, do to accelerate the, the European growth scene? It's a great question, Elias. And uh, we start out with a bird's eye view with regards to where we came from, where we are today, and then where uh, I think we're going is uh, the European technology ecosystem really started developing faster than it used to before after the last recession in 809, because the opportunity cost of going into banking, consulting, corporates came down significantly. And there was a lot more government money like tax incentives like SES, SEIS, EIS, and so on available in different countries. Um, and that uh, was in, an initial way of driving um, uh, the um, ecosystem. And then, of course, with success, more success comes, more people go into the ecosystem. And where we are today, if we just look at it anecdotally, um, we are probably seeing at least 5x the amount of companies in our size bracket um, that we saw two years ago. So this has been growing tremendously. And also what you have seen in terms of um, the capital provision, which of, often lags and follows, um, uh, is that there are a few funds, uh, new funds emerging. Um, uh, you have some of the US funds like Sequoia, Lightspeed and so on, opening offices uh, in Europe to capitalize on that opportunity. But nevertheless, from a funding perspective, the market is still extremely underpenetrated versus the market opportunity. So I think um, there are a number of things European policymakers can do. One is um, related to the provision of capital, um, be that in um, the form of R&D subsidies, be that in the form of um, uh, debt funding for um, uh, companies that are starting out and um, making sure that they can grow as fast as possible in, in, a, in a capital efficient way. Um, and, uh, which is typically the European way compared to um, the US way of thinking. And then secondly, from a regulation and tax perspective, um, there are a number of things that can be done. For example, how do we treat ESOP um, uh, from a tax perspective? Um, there are lots of issues in a number of different countries and that is often the number one way of remunerating people for taking the risk of joining a startup and making it big and then growing it and remaining in Europe uh, and not moving over to, to the US. Um, and that is something where we all need to work together. And I think um, this really goes to the EU um, as an organization. This needs to be coordinated across countries. Um, because it cannot be that um, there are different rules and regulations in every country. And that is something where I think we need to put a lot of emphasis on. And the UK then, of course, outside of the EU may have an opportunity, may also be a significant risk with regards to shaping that. Mm -hmm. So David's uh, very keen on the prospects and for any policymakers out there uh hope you heard it loud and clear it would be very helpful to have uh at least not have problems with the esops or other employee ownership plans uh to encourage the the entrepreneurial spirit which links very well as we only have a couple of minutes left to a q a that has come in from the audience around um, our views on the flow of talent to the US or from the US, I guess, or to and from, especially for entrepreneurial management as opposed to engineering roles. What can be done to compensate the salary gap which might be driving it? Uh, Jean, would you like to uh, take that? Yeah, first, I'm not sure there is that salary gap at the end of the day. You know, the total cost of ownership for a company in Europe, uh, for an employee in Europe and an employee in the US are not that different. 200K in France is 200K plus uh, 120K of uh, taxes, uh, which is 220K in the US because you only have very few taxes. So it's, it's complex to compare countries because the benefits are sometimes in the salary, sometimes on the top of the salary, depending on the countries. The, I, I'm not sure also that you have that the talent gap. Uh, we have enough managers. Uh, of course, it's great to have managers coming from anywhere in the world, there is no question. But I, I'm not sure that our issue is a lack of managers. Our current issue or for us opportunity is the lack of capital. 